Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Proverbs, and then Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter number four. I am grateful for everyone that took care of things this morning, and uh, Brother John spoke, and Brother Starr, and uh, <laughs> I had, uh, we, didn't, we didn't start the, uh, the service there at, uh, at Metro until 10 o'clock, and uh, so I knew that we started at 9.30, so it was about 10 minutes till 10 o'clock, and, uh, and I asked Mrs. Whitworth, I said, you think, uh, you think Brother Caleb's got his phone on? And uh, so she says, I don't know. I said, well, let's find out. And so I, I sent him a message just about that time so that uh, uh, we could see if he did. And uh, nothing's more distracting is when your phone's going off and you're in the middle of things. And so, but uh, I, I enjoy serving the Lord. I enjoy serving him with uh, faithful men that have been doing it for 50 years I also enjoy it for those that have just been in the ministry for a short period of time because God is still God. And he's, he's, uh, he's exciting in so many different ways. He honestly is. But the verses that we're going to look at tonight, just two, give us a little bit of insight into what takes place when the ugly shows up. We've all had it. Even as the young man was describing, some of us all have somewhat of a similar scenario and a story that tells us a little bit of a time in our, in our lives where we had to determine what we were going to do. Either we were going to follow a pathway that we made for ourselves or we're going to follow a pathway that God has in mind. It's kind of interesting to see how God refines us to make that choice that's going to be a positive aspect. I've told you before, I had, uh, I had plans to make money. I did. I grew up very poorly. And uh, I, I only recognize now how much love was there and uh, how that money meant so little to my parents because they had so little. Uh, but, uh, but we had something that, uh, that others did not. My wife made comment even last night again. She said, out of all the people in this world that I know and out, out of all the funerals that we've been at and all the circumstances, she said, still, your family's the one that has not bickered or ever said anything about trying to get something from their parents when they pass. That is just an attribute to the way my parents live. They, they loved the Lord. They just did. Dad worked in one area. We lived in the middle and went to church in another area. It was just kind of a passing thing for the most part. We were at church all the time. There was never a question. It, it wasn't until I was uh, probably a good almost 10 years old until it finally hit me that people did other things on Sunday other than go to church. I've told you that story, but I want you to look, if you would, please, at Ecclesiastes chapter number four. Look, if you would, please, in verse number nine. We'll begin there. The Bible says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Verse number 10, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath no, he has not another to help him up. I want you to notice verse number 10 here for just a minute, if we could. God has given us now a little bit of instruction as far as to find a good individual that you can help draw strength from, that you can draw some guidance from, some friendship from, and the Bible tells us that's a positive thing. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that uh, and describes very, very clearly, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. It doesn't say they get a pass. It doesn't say they get a buy. It doesn't say they are uh, going to be overlooked until later on. It just, no, it just says, <laughs> it says you will be destroyed. So in that manner, it does us well to keep in mind, I need to find people that are trying to serve God more than I am, get around them as often as I can, listen to what they say, watch how they live, do what they do, because if I want that wisdom to come to me, I better do as that wise man does. Because I want you to notice what scripture says here in verse number 10. It's for, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. Huh. So that means if you have a good companion, it's going to be less likely that you fall. Now, let's go on just a little bit further in the verse because it says this, but woe to him that is alone when 
he falleth. Not if, when. The Bible makes it very clear that you do not want to try to transverse this world alone. He makes it very clear, you better find somebody that's going to be close by. Find that individual that's going to be smarter than you are, a little better than you are, doing a little bit better off than you are. Oh, I, I, could, I could list a list of individuals in college that I hated. <laughs> I, I loved them, but I hated them at the same time. I, I, as I uh, mentioned before, when I went to high school, two things I was interested in, I was interested in sports and interested in electricity. That's all I was interested in for the most part. And, uh, and I, I was active in both. And uh, in that instance, there came a point where I really wanted to do what I wanted to do. And because of that, I, uh, I chose, I wasn't interested in academics necessarily. I was very good at math because I had to be in order to be able to calculate some of the uh, procedures for schematics and being able to read the schematics for electricity and electronics and things of that nature. So, uh, so algebra, calculus, and those things were not terribly difficult. But in that manner, there came a point where the English language, <laughs> I spoke hillbilly and I could pretty much understand English for the most part, and I figured that's good enough. Au contraire. I did not know. I thought all we're going to do is study the Bible when we go to Howells Anderson College. That's all we're going to do. I had to take an entrance exam. I'm thinking, how evil is this? This is just pure evil. And so... And then, uh, and I, I read it, and they were asking me questions about direct objects and indirect objects and predicate nominatives, and I'm thinking, how dare they talk like that right here in a Bible college? And so, and, uh, and so I took the tests and finished up, and pretty soon they had this wall outside because it could be that because you did not have the scores that you needed, you were going to have to take some remedial classes. Now, you got to pay for them, but you got no credit whatsoever. That was called the Wailing Wall is what it was called because if your name was on it, it was a sad day. And I was going out there because we had to look at it because it was going to change what we were, the classes that we we're going to take. And sure enough, it's like, I'm on the list. Get. Oh, that's a bad thing. That's, that's not a good thing at all. And so I can remember going and talking to Brother Stubblefield and he said, well, it looks like uh, you need to take uh, English. And I'm thinking, I know English. He said, no, not, not your English, real English. And I said, oh, okay. He said, you know hillbilly pretty good, but you don't know English. And so, so I had to take some of those classes. Began to realize later on how valuable that some of those things would be. I was sitting in preacher's writing seminar, and that was the name of the class. And it was taught by a lady, so it wasn't literally a preacher that was writing the seminar <laughs> that was going on. But uh, I was sitting next to a number of students that had a, a very good education. And uh, like I said, I could, I could mention their names and we were taking tests and things of that nature and they were having no problem. They were going right through it. I looked up there on that. Now I'm very good at it now. I can diagram sentences like nobody's business. But I was watching the, uh, the video that was there and all of a sudden they had, they had the diagramming of that sentence. And immediately without even, uh, there was an automatic sweat that broke out on my, on my forehead. And it's like, no, I know how to do this. I don't have to sweat anymore. I'm good at this now. But in that instance, it is just a reminder, growing up, the friends that I chose were friends that were not going to help me in the end game. But in that instance, God is reminding us here that you better surround yourself by the people that are going to do what is necessary. Because it reminds us here that the first part of this verse says, for if they fall. So you're going to be an encouragement to somebody in some capacity, and they will be an encouragement to you if you fall. Because the Bible reminds us that how can two walk together except they be agree? In that agreement, you're also going to help them from falling. Number one, you need to find the friends that are going to be friends to you and not let you stray off. You need to be the friend that you should be to help others from straying off. You need to be the one that contacts somebody when you're wondering if they're hurting it and be a help to them, an encouragement to them, and offer assistance in whatever capacity you could be. Whatever it could that you could help, assist, and to maintain a good walk with the Lord. Even as he was mentioning, I had a, I had a friend growing up. Still, I still, he was in my wedding. He's still my friend. And, uh, and, but we have not... But we don't take a lot of time to spend. He pastors in Georgia. I pastor here. 
out of all the young men that was in our home church, we are literally the only two that are still doing as the, quote, preacher boys were when we started years and years ago. I'm grateful, but there was a time that he had decided, I'm going to go to this Bible college. And at that particular point, that's where my pastor had gone. It's where the, the assistant pastor had gone. It's where a number of people and, uh, had gone. And I thought, that's exactly where I'll go. In that uh, year, because he graduated a year before I did, God began to really get on my work on my heart. My dad was the, the treasurer, and uh, so he helped count the money after the services. And I would help him on occasion. They had this, uh, and, and they had this it, it wasn't a machine but they had three or four different trays. They were green, I remember them. You'd put the change in the top and you'd shake it and then all the coins would settle according to the holes that were in them. And so I like to help shake. And, uh, and so uh, in that instance, I would sing that favorite song that uh, was written by, uh, well, anyway, we won't, but I, anyway. But, uh, and so in that instance, I happened to be in the, office there where dad was counting the money and things and and I happened to look over at the the shelf that was over there and the pastor had gone to youth or had gone to pastor school uh the uh, just a, a little bit before and I looked over there and I saw some cassette tapes and I picked it up and I said dad do you know who this is he said no son I, I don't know exactly who that is I said well I, I'm not sure who Jack Hiles is but I'm gonna I said do you think brother Forge would care if I if I take the tape and listen to it the tape some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? You remember cassette tapes. And uh, how many knew that you used the end of a pencil to wind and unwind? The, okay, good. If you knew the, the correlation and relationship between the two. And I can remember putting the cassette tape in and beginning to listen to that. And all of a sudden, my heart began to get excited. And I, I asked uh, Brother Forgey, I said, was he preaching at a meeting? He said, no, that's how he preaches all the time. I said, no. Nobody preaches like that all the time. He said, no, that's, that's Brother Hiles. That's the way he preaches all the time. And God began to move my heart. My friend came home for the summer and began to tell me some of the antics and things of that nature that was going on at college, as, we, as normally would be the case. But my heart was set now. I want to do something for God. I'm excited about the, uh, the, the messing around, the fooling around, the playing around, but... I had a focus to reach people and to reach folks for the cause of Christ. God changed my direction. There's many times how God does that, and I found that, and that with the same pursuit as I got to school, I began to look for people smarter than I was, better than I was, doing more than I was, and I just hung around them. That's all I did. And in that manner, God began to collectively pull us together even to this day. But I see here, as I read through this verse, the Bible says, for if they fall. So as I said, number one, stay close. Stay close to a good friend. Find that good friend and be that good friend that's going to help somebody when they're struggling, when they feel wayward, when they feel like pulling away, when they feel like there's a, an issue that is there. Make contact. And in whatever capacity it is, whether it's writing a note, whether it's sending a message, whether it's making a phone call, whatever the case may be, sometimes somebody may need to hear your voice just to remind them that God still loves them, you still love them, you still care for them. Stay close. Whoever it is that you need to help, you be the person that's going to help. Because I want you to notice when it comes down here, the next part of it says this. It says, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth. Keep in mind, there may be a time when a fall is coming your direction. It's there to prove what you're made out of. So before you get there, let me give you just a couple things. And these are two, easy to remember. Number one, what's the question? Where will you turn? When you fall, where will you turn? Because I'm telling you now, you won't want to turn to the right. Rarely is that the case. So you better surround yourself by that person that's going to come and find you when you have fallen and find you when you're down and find you when you have fallen. Because in that instance, where are you going to turn? It may be that the person comes and says, uh, this is self-inflicted. You understand you fell and it's your fault. They may say that. <laughs> or it could be, yeah, that's the reason. Now let me help you up. 
keep in mind where are you going to turn. I, uh, I had an instance where uh, even, in, uh, even in college, but I still use the same procedure today. When Satan starts beating up on me, you know what I do? I find somebody that is in need of prayer, and I begin to turn up the heat and asking God to take care of their needs and doing whatever it's going to take to help them out. Reason being is this, because I know that the second that Satan starts beating up on me, I'm going to try to do even more for the cause of Christ. I will intentionally stop somewhere, no matter what's going on, and I'll get out and I'll try to hand out a gospel track. I'll tell somebody about the Lord. I'll try to begin to talk to somebody about the, the Lord. Just the other day, as I was uh, stepping up on the, uh, the dock, and as I, I got up there and I began to, uh, I drive the same forklift every single night, so I got on there and I, I was getting ready to get on the the. The, the manager came out and he said, hey, uh, Paul, can I talk to you a minute? And I said, sure, what's going on? I called him by name. And all of a sudden his eyes began to water and he said, he began to tell me a story. And he said, would you pray for me like you did the other day? Because he came and his daughter was having a health issue. And as we were standing there in the little office, I said, sure. I called him by name. I said, give me your hand. So he reached out and he took my hand and I prayed for his daughter. And as he's standing there, he said, he said and, and now look, there's, there's a bunch of other truck drivers. And of course, everybody knows that truck drivers love Jesus. Amen, Brother Andy, that's the way it is. They talk about him a lot anyway. And I was standing right there, but not one single fellow around there was even in bed, because it's like, that guy does this all the time. And as I was standing there, the manager took his hand, and I said, give me your hand. I said, let me pray for you. Because he said, would you pray for me like you did the other day? I said, sure, I will. Now, is there work to be done? Yes. I didn't take a long time. And believe me, I was, I'd be able to catch up even if I did take more time that was needed. But in that instance, he said, thank you. He said, sometimes I just don't know where to turn. I said, I'll pray for you anytime. I said, come to me. Because sometimes there's going to be a fall that's coming your direction. Where are you going to turn? You can get upset. You can begin to blame. You can begin to cause, and by the way, let me put it like this. One of Satan's greatest tool is blame. He will begin to find the individuals that could be a help to you and begin to say it's their fault. They, they're the reason because of this. Because, and blame is going to be something that you're going to use, and he is going to feed it to you often when he falleth. So in that manner, where will you turn? Will you turn to, as Scripture says, the weak and beggarly elements? Will you turn to the world? Will you turn to those that seem to be accepting? Let me tell you, they may accept you today, but they'll kick you in the teeth tomorrow. In that manner, it may seem like, well, they don't, they, they, because I've sinned, they'll make fun of me. Run to them anyway, because I promise you, there'll be more help that is over there. Just keep in mind, remember the lady that came to Jesus? And he said, it's not meat for me to give the, the, the things to the dogs. And she says, yes, Lord, but the dogs at least get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus spun around and looked at his disciples and reminded them, this is great faith right here. You and I would look at it and say, but he insulted her. She said, but he's got the answer that I need. Keep in mind, godly people may not be the nicest people all the time, and we're not. We're not sometimes. We're just not. But the truth is, we've got the answer that is needed. Jesus is the answer for a lost and dying world. He's the answer for the world today, and he always will be. And in this manner, as Scripture says, when he falleth. So keep in mind, there could come in your uh, daily docket that there could be a fall right in front of you. But keep in mind, I've got somebody that will at least seek me out and find me and try to help me in those times of need. It may be that you don't feel like coming to church when you're about, when you've taken a fall, but guess where you need to show up? It may be that you don't want to. It's like, I just don't feel like it. I know feelings are, are very fickle. They're very subject to the things around us. But you need to do what is important and find the house of God, to be around the people of God and sing the songs of God and listen to the word of God. Because then, guess what? God shows up and you will need him. Plan for that when you fall. Where will you turn? Will you turn to the world? They don't have the answer. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Where will you turn? But number two, to whom will you turn? To whom will you turn? You may turn towards something. You may turn towards the, the house of God. And you may turn to a number of things, which are all positive, And it's going to help. But there's going to come a point where you have to realize it is Jesus that I've got to get to. I've got to run to him. 
think it's kind of interesting because even in Scripture, as the place was built, Bethel, the house of God. But there came a point where finally the man of God said, I'm going to name this El Bethel because I know the God of the house of God. I was standing there this afternoon. We were getting ready to slip off. The service had been completed and Brother and Mrs. Vapperzan so graciously come up. They're always so kind. They really are. And uh, I, I asked them, I said, do you care if we get a picture? They said, oh, no, we want to. And so they stood there. Brother Ray was taking the pictures. And uh, as uh, I was speaking with Brother John for just a moment or so, I said, we've got to slip out. and We've got to go. And uh, he said, thank, he, he again thanked us for coming. I said, thank you for your faithfulness. We're just here to honor uh, your faithful service. And in that manner, we just took just a moment. And I said, Brother John, as much as it would not be physically maybe as easy as it was as 50 years ago I said but I know for a fact that the same anchor that anchored you here is the same anchor that you will find no matter where you're at in this world it is our Lord keep in mind Jesus is not going anywhere he is always available he is always there and he is always there for you that's a good thing about it so scripture says there may be a time when you will fall. Try to stay as close as you can to those that will help. Stay as close as you can to those that are good Christians. Stay as close as you can to those that will help and assist. But if you find yourself away, if you find yourself alone, a fall will show up. Keep in mind, I have got to turn to the Lord. I won't feel like it, but I've got to run. I won't want to but I've got to get to the Savior. And in that manner, God has made it very clear that there may be a win in your life. Where will you turn? To whom will you turn? Make sure it is to the Savior. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house tonight. Thank you, of course, Lord, for the truth of your word. And thank you again for the message and song and the lives of these young people. Father, they have probably listened to preaching most of their entire life. They've heard sermon after sermon, and, but God, they, they recognize clearly that it's you that they must rely upon. I ask now that you'd please just help us all tonight to realize that you are still the very answer, the very sustenance, the very one that we need in time of difficulty and trouble. You've never failed and you never will. There have been people that have been sinking in the ocean and you have rescued. There have been those that have been facing circumstances far beyond their capabilities and you've rescued. But Father, there have been those that have said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So Lord, I do ask that you'd please help us even tonight to rely upon you, look towards you, and trust in your word and what you do. I ask, of course, for your help. In just a second, we're going to stand with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed. The instruments will begin to play. Maybe you've already been feeling that tug of being a pull away from the Lord. Maybe it seems as though circumstances may bring about a stumble. It could be that discontent and feelings are pulling on you right now. Maybe it is that Satan has already been beating on you very, pretty badly. Maybe it's time you find this altar and say, dear God, I just need you. And just say, I'm, I just want to know that you're close by. I want to know that you care for me and that you love me. And just allow the Lord to be close. Take some time with him, whatever the case may be. Let's all stand with our heads bowed with our eyes closed. As the instrument begins to play, if God's spoken to your heart tonight, the altar is open. You may come. Scripture says, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth. There is no if there. Stay close. Find the friend and be the friend you should be. But if
if that fall does head your direction, plan before it. Plan to change before the command to change. If that's the case, then that means be ready. Turn towards the Savior. As Mrs. Whitworth plays through one last verse as Christians are praying. Obedience is something that God counts as a very high commodity. Just be the person you should be. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you again, Lord, for your gracious kindness and mercy. Lord, I do ask now that you'd please just continue to work in our hearts and lives to accomplish your will. And Lord, thank you so much for our church. Thank you again for what you've done. And thank you, Lord, for allowing us to do your will. I do ask that you'd please just work now. Thank you again for the safety that you've provided the, the tour group, Lord. And I ask now that you'd please continue to use them even the next few days as youth conference is right on the cusp. Lord, I do ask that you'd please just help us now to do your will. Thank you again for your kindness, and thank you for our church. In Jesus' name, amen.